Tynesha Felder is looking through her phone when she suddenly gets a FaceTime call. She had been waiting in her car at around midnight on Monday, November 26, 2018 for her date, 28-year-old Walter Johnson, to come out of the home at 1917 South Boulevard in Maitland, Florida. About an hour earlier, Tynesha and Walter went out on a date after meeting each other that evening on the Tinder app. She drove 45 minutes from a pop cut to pick him up from this home before they went to Waffle House, where they ate and she paid. Both described it as a bad date. Tynesha was inputting directions home as she waited for Walter to come to tell her that it was okay for her to use the bathroom inside before her long trip back. That's when she got the FaceTime call from the intoxicated Walter. But it was an accidental dial. She saw him through her phone as wide-eyed. She said there was mumbling and loud music in the background. Less than five minutes after walking inside the home, a visibly stressed Walter emerges, opens the passenger side door, and closes it. He immediately tells her to just drive. As they're driving, he picks up the phone. I'm on one, you need police, fire, or medical? I need police. Uh, there's been a homicide committed. Oh my god, there's a cop's car right there. Go right there. Just sit right here in front of the cop sure. car. Yeah, um, my roommate's... I don't know what this. I know why the, would, there was a problem with the kid that's dead in the house right now, but I don't know exactly what just happened. I just walked in the house, they killed him. Earlier that night, 23 year old Jake Balada and 20 year old Ianati McClurg, referred henceforth as Ian, were lounging in the home they rented with two other roommates, 23 year old Cedric Wells and Walter Johnson. At the time, Cedric was working at the 24-7 InTouch call center in Altamonte Springs while Walter was out on his date. Jake and Ian were drinking, smoking weed, and doing lines of cocaine for something they called pre-gaming, which is the act of getting intoxicated before a social event. The roommates were party animals, they often frequented social media in search of parties at Florida State University and the University of Central Florida. On this night, Jake said he'd been looking through Snapchat when he came upon a post by a woman named Desiree, who said she had a party at her place. Jake, who went by J Bill's Wavy on Instagram, said he messaged his buddies to come through to the party. One of those buddies was 24-year-old Joshua Barnes, who went by Mr. Can't Do It on the photo sharing app. A text conversation followed. At 11 p.m., Jake writes, I'm leaving then, had your chance. Joshua responds, what's your number? Joshua texts again, yo, and again, yo. Jake writes back with three question marks. Joshua responds, G at my busing house around the corner from you, period. Meet me at the sunrail. Joshua adds, keep trying to fuck. I said drop me off first. Joshua adds, you know where the sunrail is? Jake responds, get dropped off, then we leave in 10 minutes. Joshua responds, bruh, he posting, I'm talking about the shit by CJ job. Jake responds, okay, so you stuck, then dropped in Winter Park, I'm going opposite direction, pull up or no can do. Joshua responds, damn bitch. Joshua adds, I'm walking your way, I gave this n-word, gas and all. Jake responds, sorry boo, I don't get gas from no one, otherwise I would have. Joshua responds, damn, so nah? Jake responds, how long to walk? Joshua says, 30 minutes or meet me at Wawa or some. I'm finna leave now. In layman's terms, Joshua was looking to get a ride from his place, but Jake didn't want to travel in the opposite direction to get him, so Joshua walked the 30 minutes. Sometime after Walter made the 911 call, police stepped into a bloody scene. There was blood in the front foyer, the kitchen, and the floor and the walls of the hallway that included the four rooms of the people living there. Laying next to Ian's room was Joshua covered in garbage bags wrapped in duct tape. The autopsy report showed he had suffered 17 stab and slash wounds, eight of which were critical. Two stab wounds went through his right breast and connected with his lung. Two went through his left lung, including one from the back of his shoulder. Another two through the middle of his chest, through his chest cavity. Joshua bled out. 
An Alert 1 helicopter, which has heat detection cameras, was dispatched because the suspected assailant had fled the scene. He's not moving. They have plastic bags. The, 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 the man is on a plastic bag. He's dead. He's dead. He's, he's a kid. 24-year-old Joshua Barnes was described as a promising working father to a 4-year-old son. He was employed at the 24-7 in-touch call center in Altamonte Springs and was a member of the Experience Christian Center in Pine Hills, which he was at on the Sunday before he was killed. I just saw him, and little did we know that'll be the last time we'd even see him here living, Pastor Derek McRae told ClickOrlando.com. It was kind of shocking for all of us to know it happened and hear about how it happened. He shared a loving bond with his brother Raymond, who said Joshua was his role model. Joshua had an interest in basketball, video games, and drawing, but he was also said to have great potential in the field of music. His artist's name was Sosa Rari, but friends called him Sosa. He posted his music to SoundCloud. His mentor, Marlon Daniels, told Click Orlando that he had discussed his future with him and saw a hardworking man who was plotting his path for the rest of his life. Many tributes are left behind on his Instagram posts, which note a guy who made them laugh. Raymond said Joshua had a lot of friends, but cautioned people about who you get too close to. If they're not your family, or haven't been around your family, or haven't seen your family, don't trust them, Raymond told Click Orlando. Is there anybody else at the house? <laughs> it's, it's my roommates. These are people I live with. Are your roommates there at the house? Yes, they're there right now. You need to, like, go take Okay, me. you're not there? Take care of this. After five years of living in Savannah, Georgia, Ian McClurg was finally one step closer toward his career in the music business. An aspiring manager of artists, the 20-year-old was offered a spot to study music business at Full Sail University, a school offering degrees in entertainment media. In the summer of 2017, he moved to the Crane's Landing Apartments off of Goldenrod in Winter Park, Florida. It was there, after the 2017 winter break, that he met Jake Bellotta through friends. Jake had been a neighbor in the apartment building. Ian recalls that Jake was not attending Full Sail and didn't appear to have a job, but always looked like he had money. Jake was making hip-hop music under the name J-Bills, and the pair bonded over their love of music. In or around September 2018, about a year after Ian moved to Florida, he decided he didn't want to live in the apartment anymore, so he spoke with his full sale buddy Cedric, Jake, and a guy named Jackie about splitting rent on the single-family home at 1917 South Boulevard in Maitland. Ian had a realtor all lined up. He just needed confirmation that the four can commit their part of the rent so they can afford it. The four agreed and they moved in. But Jackie was eventually put on academic probation and decided to go back to Savannah, Georgia, so they needed to fill the rent gap. That's when Jake recommended his friend Joshua Barnes. Jake and Joshua would spend time together in the closet recording music. The bonds that held this group together were partying and music. Everyone in the new home was either into producing or managing the people making the music. But it wouldn't be very long before problems began to emerge in the new home. It started with allegations that Joshua was leaving the door unlocked and unattended when they were away. And then it was Joshua not paying rent, despite them badgering him about it. Two weeks before Joshua's death, Jake pulled him aside and told him this wasn't going to fly in the household. Being the only guy with a car at the home, Jake helped Joshua move his stuff into what Joshua said was his sister's place. Jake said it took a while for Joshua to communicate with him again because he was upset but Jake said the two still considered each other friends. Now, the group needed what started to appear like the elusive fourth roommate. That's when they brought in Walter Johnson. Walter, who also made music, had been working at the 24-7 in-touch call center and got Ian his job there in the fall of 2018. Recall that Cedric also worked at the center. The group got along with each other through music, skateboarding, and partying. Walter and Jake weren't familiar with each other, and he didn't really have the opportunity to bond when Walter was moving in. That's because, for a critical two-week period, Jake was in Boston to see family. He killed, he killed this kid. He seriously... So you didn't witness them injure him, you just saw him on the ground, right? 
Ma'am, you need to get an ambulance. When I tell you, if he's not dead, then he sure. is critically sure, injured. already on the way. As police made their way through the home, they made a couple of notable discoveries. There was a PlayStation 4 game console laying behind a couch, a huge hole in the bedroom door at the back of the house with fresh pieces of that door on the floor, and Ian sitting inside the bathroom at the back of the home. Ian, who was very nervous, said he didn't want to move because he was afraid of being shot. He resigned himself to the situation and told police that he last saw his roommate inside the house, but he wasn't sure where he was now. About 50 minutes after police responded to the scene, just after 12.30 a.m., the helicopter got thermal vision on a man hiding under a tree at the back of a closed game store at 8550 South US 1792. A canine was also sent to force him out. He eventually came out with his hands over his head. It was Jake Bellotta. He had cuts, including on his wrist and big toe. He had no shoes, he was all wet, bloody, and he was crying. Is there, you got any injuries on you? Yeah, when I, he, tried, he tried to stab me with the knife. And like, Who did? <laughs> what? Jake, where are you injured? <laughs> my wrist is it's in my hand. He tried to stab me, I grabbed the knife. And Jake grew up in Massachusetts and was raised primarily by his grandparents during his infancy because of his parents' work schedule. He had aspirations of becoming a chef, so out of high school, he enrolled in the culinary arts school Le Cardin Bleu in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It was there that he was made to purchase a kitchen knife set that included a 9-inch butcher blade. He subsequently gained employment as a chef at Olive Garden, showcase cinemas, and worked in kitchens and other establishments. He had moved to Florida in 2018 to pursue a career in music. At that point though, he was doing it in his spare time and played the role of the guy mixing and matching and recording the music. He was notable for having tattoos of dollar bills on his neck and released some music on SoundCloud. It's not clear how he made his money when he moved to Florida. Friends described him as intimidating. Any change to the home he shared with three others had to be run past him or he would throw a fit. Jake was a daily trash talker. He often told friends what appeared to them as tall tales of him following through on threats to kill rivals. He often talked about killing anyone who upset him. But no one took him seriously whenever he said stuff like that because the threats seemed outlandish. Whether or not they believed his threats, Ian and Cedric feared him. And they would have even more reason to do so after a boy's trip to Sarasota. Are you fucking kidding me? Okay, are you still waiting at the oh corner like I asked God. you to? Oh my God, I gotta go, I gotta go. What is that behind us? Is that a truck? Oh, that's a cop. That's a cop. Yes, okay, thank God, okay. A couple of weeks before the incident, Jake, Ian, Cedric, and a guy named Jackie went out to Sarasota to meet one of Ian's friends to party. It was all fun and games until it wasn't. A series of bad things would happen that would start the chain reaction of events that would shatter the lives of multiple people. According to Jake, Ian got extremely emotional while intoxicated and ran away from the car. Then Jackie ended up crashing the car, which stranded the group on the road. They had to get an Uber ride back home, which knocked them back some hundred dollars. When they got back, they discovered that Ian had somehow shattered a window in the bedroom. The series of errors made Jake hopping mad. Jake said that he got so mad that he punched that massive hole through his bedroom door. Since that incident, Jake had belittled Ian and talked down to everyone in the house. That didn't sit well with Joshua, who objected to the way Jake carried himself. It was one of the things Joshua held against Jake and that put a wedge in their relationship. A couple of weeks later, on that cursed November 26th day, Jake had come back from his two-week trip to Boston. He had stayed only briefly with a friend in Daytona the night before as he made the 22-hour drive back. Cedric needed to be dropped off at the call center, so Jake, on little sleep, took him to work. Meanwhile, Walter had just finished his shift at the site, so Jake picked him up and took him home. When they got home, Jake put his marijuana in the fridge and went to his room to take a nap for about an hour. Sometime later, Ian, who is also napping, is rocked awake. Looming over him is Jake, who is steaming mad. I can't find my stuff. Moments earlier, Jake noticed that his bong, scale, watch, and his PlayStation 4 were missing. 
What Jake didn't know at the time was that the roommates did their own investigation into who may have broken into the home while Jake was in Boston. They noticed that the bed next to the broken window had a footprint on it. They also noticed that most of the stuff taken was Jake's. The only other thing stolen was Cedric's shoes. They knew that whoever did this was known to the group, and probably had it out for Jake. Okay. Is the officer with you? Did you guys go there? You guys need to go there. My other roommate is going to go there. Hey, look man, we know you took the PlayStation 4, Walter told Joshua over Instagram. No hard feelings, just bring it back, do the right thing. I didn't take your stuff, Joshua replied. I didn't do that. At some point, Jake, Ian, Walter, and Cedric met at the call center and discussed the situation over some weed in Jake's car, but nothing was resolved. Throughout the evening, Ian and Jake sat in the den drinking, smoking marijuana, and doing lines of cocaine on the table. Ian was using his phone to blast music through the home's Bluetooth speaker. Jake is jamming his head and trying to relax. He said he was irritated and wondered why Joshua would take his stuff, but then testified that he didn't really think Josh was that type of person. Ian similarly shared the view that he didn't think it could be Joshua, wasn't the type of guy and all of that. Jake said he decided he would try to let bygones be bygones and invited Joshua over to Desiree's party to talk it out. I really think that at the end of the day, I don't think he was actually doing that. I think he was just putting on because he was mad about the situation of being kicked out, Jake said in court. I didn't think he was really trying to steal these items and run away with them. I think he was just trying to make a statement. Throughout the evening, Ian and Jake sat in the den getting high. By this point, Walter was out on his date and Cedric was at work. There were two very brief FaceTime video calls between Jake and Joshua as Joshua was walking toward the house. Jake said he thought it would take Joshua a little longer, but then he heard a knock at the door soon after, making him think it was Walter. Ian got up and started walking through the hallway toward his bedroom. Jake said he'd been using the 9-inch butcher knife he purchased at culinary school to chop up the marijuana when he heard the knock, so he carried the knife with him to answer. When Jake opened the door, Joshua was at the doorstep with a backpack slung around his shoulder. Jake said he walked right past him near the hallway, then turned around and dropped the backpack on the floor. That's when Jake said Joshua saw the knife in his hand. Jake felt Joshua was insulted by the situation. Jake said Joshua then started raising his voice. Oh, you're gonna kill me. Are you gonna kill me? That's when he said Joshua reached for Jake's knife hand and grabbed his arm. Jake said he tried to pull away, but then the situation turned into a tussle that went from zero to a hundred. In the struggle, Jake said he stabbed Joshua twice in the front of his body. The second stab lodged the knife so deep in Joshua's body that he struggled to pull the knife out. He said he was afraid Joshua would take possession of the knife, so he pushed Joshua to the floor and then made a run to his room. But he said Joshua was fighting back. There was a tussle in the hallway after Jake realized that his bedroom door was locked. At some point, Jake said he had fallen on top of Joshua, inflicting another deep stab wound. Joshua then lay motionless in the hallway. It was at this point that Jake said he started freaking out and asked Ian what was going on and what they were going to do. Jake said he was concerned about all the illegal paraphernalia in the home, such as the drugs, so they declined to call police and decided to clean up the mess. As Ian stood there shocked, Jake handed the knife to him because he said he wanted to separate himself from it. He told Ian to grab a mop and start cleaning, while Jake tended to his wounds in the kitchen before returning with duct tape and garbage bags in which he would put Joshua's body. That's the scene Walter walked into the night he called emergency services. Ian had answered the door because Walter was having trouble unlocking it. Walter said he remembered seeing Ian physically there, but he was completely mentally checked out. Complete shock seized him. Walter said he then took the knife from Ian's hand and told him to sit down and calm himself. That's when Walter saw Jake standing over Joshua. Walter said when he went over to Jake, he noticed Ian following him. For the mere minutes Walter's inside that house, he was in survival mode. He needed to figure out how to get out of the house without getting assaulted because he wasn't sure what had happened. He credited the alcohol in his system with helping him remain relatively calm. He knew about the burglary, so he had to have been thinking that maybe, just maybe this time, Jake followed through on his threats. Wow, Walter told Jake. 
You really killed this motherfucker. I could f with you. I could f with you now. I know that you real. Walter then said he would be back to help after letting his date go. It turned out to be a life-saving lie. Because Jake was apparently trying to save his own life by lying through his own trial for first-degree murder. Let's rewind a little bit. Cedric and Joshua had been close friends. Close enough that Joshua had previously logged his Instagram into Cedric's phone. One day after the burglary, Cedric noticed that he could switch to Joshua's account on his Instagram. So he did that. Cedric then called Walter over to see what he was seeing. It was a private message in which Joshua bragged about stealing the items from the home. In it, Joshua said that the boys are sweet, connoting a softness to their character, and said they won't do anything about it. The worst thing these guys could have done was tell Jake about the message. Walter took the screenshot of the message and then showed it to Jake. From the moment Jake's eyes laid on the message until the incident at the home, the gates of hell were open. Jake was henceforth carrying several things on his mind, his stuff being stolen, being disrespected, and by not taking action, he would be allowing further robberies to take place under his domain. Unacceptable. Walter tried and failed to calm him down, so he left the house and went on the Tinder app to find himself some company that night. Meanwhile, Ian had also extracted himself from the tension, but returned to the home when Jake asked. Ian said he had been operating in total fear of Jake and would later say that he was concerned about what Jake would do if he didn't return to the home that night. Walter, Ian, and Cedric each offered to buy Jake another PlayStation 4, but the gesture didn't calm him down. Jake had at some point asked Walter to get him a gun, but Walter didn't. Throughout the evening, Jake was seething. He repeatedly said he was going to kill Joshua, he was going to cut his head off with his katana sword and that he needed to bring him back to the house, but he needed a ruse. Why in the world would Joshua return to the home from which he stole Jake's stuff? Ian said he didn't believe Joshua would do it, so that line of thought put Ian at ease. But then as the night progressed, things started to get more critical. Joshua actually believed that Jake was inviting him to a party. When looking back at the text message asking Joshua how long it would take him to walk over, Jake puts down two question marks. Perhaps that was his style. But Ian testified that the longer Jake had to wait for Joshua to show up, the angrier he got. As if making him wait was another form of disrespect. Jake had no intention of picking up Joshua, not because it was in the opposite direction. It was because he wanted to kill him in the house. And when Joshua confirmed it would be 30 minutes until he's at the house, that's when Ian knew he was in big trouble. Ian would testify that he wanted to warn Joshua not to come, but because the music was playing through his phone, he knew trying to text him would alert Jake. The second reason Ian didn't rebel was because earlier that day, Jake had threatened to beat him with a bat over money he owed Jake. And the third reason, as mentioned, was that there's no way Joshua would show up. The plan, as outlined by Jake, was to get Joshua inside the door so he could start the attack. Ian's job was to block Joshua from running to the back door and escaping. But Ian did not abide. As soon as Jake turned his back toward him, Ian went to his room. He could only hear the stab sounds and the screams. Are you going to kill me? You're going to kill me. You're killing me. Joshua had run past Ian's room through the hallway trying to get out, but Jake was there to slash at him. There was no struggle. There was no fight from Joshua. Joshua never had the weapon. This was an ambush. Joshua then tried running toward the front door again, but eventually collapsed and died from blood loss. Joshua didn't even have time to take off his backpack. Jake then stood over Joshua's body and repeatedly said, Do you think we're sweet now? When Walter came by, he saw Jake fiddling with Joshua's body, smirking. He said he heard Jake say, this mother put up a great fight. After putting his body in the bags, Jake went through Joshua's backpack, which had blood and stab holes in it. Inside were items suggesting he was going to a party, a change of clothes and a wallet with condoms. 
and then this motherfucker was going to bring it back jake said smiling and laughing as he pulled his playstation 4 out of the backpack ian pleaded guilty to being an accessory after the fact and tampering with evidence in exchange for 10 years in prison he agreed to testify against jake his testimony ran counter to Jake's version of events, which was laid out when he took the stand himself in his defense. The defense argued that this was a classic case of self-defense. Jake's team argued that no one but Jake and Joshua saw what happened because Ian wasn't actually an eyewitness, so he couldn't have seen who was the aggressor. Jake's team further argued that there was no plan to murder him because the texts show Jake was going to leave for the party with or without Joshua. The defense also pointed to Jake's blood in the foyer near the door, arguing that he was likely attacked. But the state argued that the blood got there after he had killed Joshua. The police testified that they saw a silhouette of a person through the window, which was likely Jake looking out for them, prosecutors said. The prosecution also argued that the plan to have Ian block the hallway to prevent Joshua from escaping, his friends denying there was a party, and his anger and threats leading up to the night proved this was premeditated. The prosecution also pointed to Jake's lies about what they called relatively simple matters, like how the hole in his bedroom door was created. He said that was the result of Ian breaking the window weeks prior. But that didn't align with the fact that the police saw fresh door pieces on the night of Joshua's murder. What really happened, the state argued, was that Jake broke it after finding out Joshua disrespected him. Surely you called Jake Bellotta was found guilty as charged. He was sentenced to life without parole. Jake didn't give Joshua the time to talk things out as he claimed he was going to do in his testimony. Had he given Joshua a chance to speak, they may have made amends. But with Jake, it appeared the cut of being disrespected ran too deep. He was a good kid, Walter said about Joshua in court. I had no problems with him. You know, obviously he robbed the house, but you can even see in my message I still didn't have a problem with him. I just wanted him to not get in trouble. I didn't want the police to be involved, get him in more trouble. Wanted his music to be successful. He loved my music, and he wasn't afraid to say it. He was a good kid. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to me narrate this story which is based largely on the primary sources. Special mention goes to the local reporters who are reporting from the ground and to you guys for engaging in the subject matter. Be well, engage in acts of charity, and don't be Jake Bellotta.